Hello, and welcome to today's webinar event powered by Vine Medical. Vine Medical has the pleasure of hosting today's webinar event, The Advantages of Automation and Automation Possibilities with Neo Cairo. We will begin this event moderated by Vine Medical's Chief Commercial Officer, Scott Overholt, shortly. Afterward, we will have a no holds barred Q&A session. We may not have the opportunity to address all questions during the presentation, but please feel free to ask any questions in the questions section of the platform, and we will get to as many as we can during the Q&A. This webinar is being recorded, and once the live webinar concludes, our system prepares an email to be sent to the email addresses that you registered with. We know that a lot of you would like other members of your staff to be able to watch the webinar, so please rest assured that it is recorded and sent as a follow-up. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I am Scott Overholt, Chief Commercial Officer with Vine Medical. We are thrilled today to have uh, Neo Cairo who, as our speaker, who I'll introduce to you in just a second. Um, Vine is very excited about, um, about the topic for today's uh, session uh, in that it is super timely and topical in our industry, as we all know. Um, so let me introduce Neo real quickly. Neo Cairo is the president and CEO of the Cairo Group, which provides organizational transformation, integration, innovation, advisory, leadership development services. She's formerly the RVP or the SVP of Revenue Cycle at Tufts Medicine in Boston. Um, we're super excited to have uh, Neo today because she brings uh, a vast knowledge of ex and experience in hospital and physician revenue cycle um, management. Um, she has vast experience in Lean Six Sigma, which she's used to bridge the chasm between financial and clinical care, which as we all know, can be really challenging. Um, she basically has um, enabled hospitals to integrate re revenue cycle services that meet or exceed HFMA K KPI standards. She's uh, presented in front of Congress. She's been an expert in the military um, and has led a standard there for healthcare data exchange. Um, she was named as one of the top 25 innovators in 2021 by Modern Healthcare. So, Neo, we are thrilled to have you with us today and excited about your presentation. So, I'll hand it over to you. Well, thank you so much, Scott. You know, this topic is one that all of us are almost drinking from a fire hose because it seems like every month there's some new wonderful things that are happening in automation. And we have to keep up. Um, so, I am really excited about sharing some information and hopefully having a good conversation as we go through the process. Very good. The slide. Very good. Um, next slide. Let me just talk a little bit about our learning objectives before uh, we begin the actual session. Today with NEO's leadership, uh, we'll discuss the advantages and possibilities of automation. We'll look at determining how to prioritize task-oriented work for automation and examine the importance of partnerships to ensure automation is optimized in your workflow. So uh, we're excited about this, Neo. And with that, let me turn it over to you to begin the session. Thank you. You know, I figured that the first thing we need to do is level set and understand how artificial intelligence is really impacting the workforce and our productivity in North America. And it's, um, so I was able to do some research, and even though this particular report is from 2017, it was an impact at that year of 14.5% of the current GDP in 2017, which is $3.7 trillion, versus the assumption that it will be 26.1% uh, in 2030. The fact of the matter is, just in 2019, there was 220 to 360 billion dollars that were able to be savings by using automation in North America. That's a mind boggling number. And it also tells you that, yes, it is something that can truly revolutionize 
how we do our business and the cost reductions that we can do. The other thing that's very interesting is that um, McKenzie did a study in 2020 and they identified that 375 million people will have to change the way that they do their work due to automation. And that's 14% of the global workforce. We could go to the next slide. So what does that mean for healthcare? And this is a study in 2020 done by PWC that basically says that if we look at a scale from one to five, um, one being the lowest and five being the highest, it is an impact generalized at a 4%, uh, four of the five. There is a major impact in the way that uh, clinical care will be done and also a major impact in how we do our operational supportive care for our patients, our organizations, and of course the revenue cycle. Something that's really interesting, there was also this, um, this study that was done by McKenzie that found that our current new physicians, what they have learned, will only be valid by 6% in 10 years. That is how fast automation and AI is actually changing the game in knowledge of how we can deliver care and how we understand disease processes. So we are literally running a race to keep up with technology and the information and the data discovery that goes along with it. If we go to the next slide, please. So when we look at the US human health and social work automation projections, and this is um, again from PwC, and they did this for the whole, uh, it was a global initiative. And they were looking at what is gonna be the impact uh, to the worker. And what is really important is that right now we're talking about a 2% impact to the global, uh, to the North American workforce, 4% uh, for males and about 2%, uh, almost 3% uh, for females. But the fact of the matter is there is a major change in the education level of the individuals. And this is where we go into how we must, as leaders, lead differently, because we must upskill our workforce to keep up with the technology that is coming their way, and also so that they can be part of the integration and part of teaching these innovative um, models how to work. So as we look at this, we must understand that this is this was very focused in the health care delivery side of the house, not the revenue cycle side of the house. But as we go to the next slide, we start seeing what revenue cycle has to say. And that is that almost 80% of the hospitals and health systems use some form of automation in 2021 versus 66%. Now, something that's really interesting and um, I laugh about this because we forget that we've actually been using automation for a very long time. This was something that was plentiful in the 1950s, pretty much in the government. Um, going and looking at data and using uh, large computers to basically synthesize data, whether uh, it was to understand what was going around uh, the world and being able to look at newspapers and put together packets uh, for um, Congress and the president of what is the projection that is happening around the world for all different industries. And then we ourselves, if you remember back, and I'm, I'm dating myself, but I remember being in Deloitte uh, in the 90s and going to different hospitals and putting in automation for uh, basically cash posting. And, you know, and at that time we were talking about macros uh, and we used access databases. 
And that was the initial start, right? We, we were just doing the little walk of using macros to basically automate repetitive tasks. And we spent a great deal of time understanding the workflow so that we could do this automation. Well, we're doing basically the same thing. The only thing is the tools are better. And the reason I say that to you is because I want you to remember that you are the ever-changing group of healthcare delivery people. People in revenue cycle, people in finance have always been trying to figure out a new Rubik's Cube of being able to deliver services with no money. Because we spend all our money in the clinical side and usually revenue cycle is the area that their budget is always cut, but the expectations are always higher. So now we're not using macros, now we're using bots. And what are bots? Bots are your FDE. And, and this is, your people are your talent, but your bots are truly FDEs, if you think about it. Why? Because they don't stop working. Your bots can work 24 hours a day where an FTE has to, to go to sleep, has to go home, and has a limited time of work. And they should be your critical thinkers, where your bot is just giving you the expected outcome as you designed it. And more importantly, we have to remember that as we're doing this automation, if we have bad processes, your results will be bad. It's not the bot's fault. You have to take the time to create good processes to go through them, to, to actually get the outcomes and the efficiencies that you want. Let's go to the next slide. And here we talk about RPA, which is the repetitive processing automation that we have all adopted. And we're using that for claim statusing. We're using it for uh, a lot of the front end processes that we're doing, like uh, discovery, uh, benefits, uh, you know, being able to do things that we're basically pulling information from one API to your main system into another API and being able to quickly process these things. And what are we getting? We're getting true efficiencies, an increase of 91% in the industry, just using automation to handle those tasks. We're also seeing the cost reduction. Remember the number I said earlier, uh, it's mind boggling that 360 billion 2019 was achieved around the world in efficiencies and cost reductions by using automation. And then we are also seeing the capabilities of being able to increase uh, the revenue capture. You know, it, it was funny because there was a time that we, the revenue capture had a lot of manual processes. And we have moved away from that. And now we do the automation. But not only are we doing the automation to understand that everything was captured based on how we designed it, but on top of it, now we're looking at the data and making sure no pennies were left on the table. So we're doing a scrub through the data to make sure that we've captured every single charge. This is new and it's the hyper automation outside of just what is expected from the system. And then there's also the employee satisfaction of giving self-service. Self-service to the employees and self-service to probably also your customer. Your customer now can pay for the, by themselves and set up their payment plans online and be able to do many other things like self-schedule. So now we're seeing that we're giving our patients similar to what we have been getting from the hotel industry, from airline industry, you know, that they see it as a failure if, they, if somebody actually makes a phone call because you should be able to handle everything that you need by using automated systems. Scott? I'm sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. I'm sorry, I'm talking away over here on mute. Imagine that. 
Um, yeah, that was super insightful. Thank you so much, Neo. And your 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 uh, talk about macros brought back a lot of memories for me. I can remember in the early 90s, um, automating spreadsheets galore with, with macros, which was, you know, incredible at the time. And, and you're right, it's been going on a long time and it continues. And it seems that we have, you know, quite a bit of runway ahead of us too, uh, to continue to improve this. One of the things that I run into, you know, in my revenue cycle business um, is aversion to risk, right? Um, that, that folks um, are feeling nervous about moving forward with, with, um, with uh, automation and, and AI. Um, what are ways that, that we can help our clients uh, get past this? Um, what are some best practices that you that you have observed? Well, the aversion to risk is uh, kind of well-founded, if you really think about it. Um, it's something new. We have to be very cautious with our financial dollar and make sure that there is a return on investment. But the most important thing is the strategy that is used when implementing and going forth with automation making sure that you take small bites and that you do the modification and that you are invested in a team that is actually monitoring and working together, understanding your workflow so that you're using automation where you need it. You can't expect to do it all. You have to start small and then progress. And that's the whole issue is that if you create a good strategy and you take small bites you know we are so used to implementing things in a waterfall and what that means is that we want everything to be built and then we turn it on the mm -hmm. fact of the matter that's not the way we even grow as an individual first as a child you learn to crawl and then you you basically stop creeping up and the next thing that you do is you take a step but we need to apply the same thing with automation. We need to test it, you know, be aware of where you have the pitfalls, make the correction, and then go into expanding your portfolio of automation. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much. And I think before we continue with the program, we have a poll question. And the poll question basically is how well versed are you or your organization in the subject of automation and AI? Please select one and we will, um, we will share the results here in a moment. Okay, Jen, can you? See how our audience has voted. Mm. Um, yes, did it not? Oh, let me share results real quick. There you go. And uh, it looks like the majority of us feel like we're very um, well versed, and that is very encouraging. Um, many that I thought would be number one is somewhat. Uh, and a few just a little, and zero not at all, which is encouraging. So in interesting information, and with that, we'll turn it back over to Neo to continue the program. Neo? Absolutely. And, you know, that's actually very exciting to see uh, the numbers of that poll. Uh, it says that, you know, we're all invested in the automation, and it, it goes along with all of the different studies that have been um, put forth. You know. The other thing is the amount of money that has been put into uh, new solutions and capabilities um, for automation. The reality is that of the 13 different industries that automation is, is playing a part in, healthcare was the one area of greatest um, open field. And the reason for it is it's a little bit harder in healthcare for automation and AI to come in. But on the clinical side, it's because it has to be 100%, right? You can't have a mistake that will take a life or that could damage a life. Whereas in other industries, you can have a one or 2% error rate and it's acceptable. Now, 
in the finance area and when we're looking at revenue cycle we already have been acclimated to having a percentage rate of error and it means that we have the ability the question is who is best positioned to lead us in many of the healthcare stakeholders and it's really us us in revenue cycle we are able to be the leaders in healthcare due to the fact that we know that it's an ever-changing situation and we are able to nimbly be able to adjust in an agile manner to the changes. Um, if we can go to the next slide. So when we look at um, automation, I think the first thing is the common language. Uh, there was a study done by Gardner um, that basically said that 48% of the people say that they really don't know the different language. What they know is that automation works. 90% of, of everyone in healthcare says it can impact us. However, they don't know the difference between the different statements of, um, of common language and definitions. So robotic processing automation, we kind of all know this. This is the, I predictly tell a bot to do this, uh, to basically um, go to this work queue and from that work queue to basically process uh, the claim based on these criteria, and a bill goes out the door. So basically you give them a predictive task and the bot is able to do it. And it's able to do it at a high increased speed so that you have a means of being able to process things without having a human have to do the task. However, it needs to be monitored because bots do break. And you have to make sure that you are monitoring the bot. But that's the robotic processing. You could say that is your initial first step in automation. Artificial intelligence is now where you're basically taking models and you're not only doing the processing, the automated processing, but you're also trying to think like a human, give the syst that, that system the ability to perform human tasks and problems to solve. So now it's taking information and it's making decisions based on the criteria that you told them that if this happens, then you behave like this, or this can prompt another thing. So now the system is learning from the data and able to make solutions associated to that data. That's artificial intelligence. And then when we move, machine learning is a form of artificial intelligence that is doing the learning and it can be supervised, meaning that uh, you are supervising the data and the outcomes. It could also be unsupervised, that you're letting the machine actually make decisions based on the information that is processed. And then it could also be um, in a reinforcement state. And the reinforcement state is now there's some decisions that the machine is making, but you are actually increasing the, the knowledge of the machine of reaction so that the machine is not only giving you information, but actually reacting to the information that is providing you. So th this gives you a breadth and depth of being able to do much more than just a predictable task. Now it's doing things like reacting to outcomes. I'll give you an example. Prior authorization. Using machine learning and conversational AI, you can have a machine actually call a payer and go through all the process of the prior authorization, asking the correct questions, getting the data and processing the data, and be able to do pre-authorizations, which is right now being done in pharmacy, um, Walgreens, all the big ones. They use this technology that it is a machine doing machine conversation and machine learning to handle prior authorizations. 
It is also now coming into the provider space, but that is a great example of how machine learning can be used to be much more than just a data output and giving you clues, but also to be able to interact and actually deliver a goal. And then there's large language models. And the large language models is basically being able to ask questions, clarify text, uh, being able to write, um, you know, good um, results and transactions. And then we have the favorite that has come through in the last few months, and that's the chat GPT. This is one that everybody is scared of and happy about all at the same time. And I tell you, you should be happy because what it is is no different than when we were in the industrial age and all of a sudden we were able to have, um, you know, uh, industry create machines to create um, you know, recipes and be able to create the cookie and to be able to do, do different things. It was a different way of doing things and we have to react to it. However, it can really change the way we do business. Now think about how fast you can put training products together for your staff. How fast you could take the information that came from the payer and now distribute it so that your staff knows exactly how to react to the new rules in your contracts. This is now giving you the ability to not be behind the payer formats, but be at par with the payer because you can take the information and always be feeding and basically training in a continuous model, your people are going to be at their highest level. And you can also use it to be able to do the transactions with the payer. And now you're not just statusing, but you're reacting to that status. And you're able to respond to those denials in a better way. So the possibilities are truly endless when you think about the chat GPT. And that's where we have to look at how do we do this? How do we make it cost effective? The reality is we have to rethink how we are looking at our budgets. So when I was at Tufts, I had a situation that I had over 100 people short from my staff. And one of the things that I thought of was, well, let's bring AI to supplement um, my shortfalls. So now, instead of saying, to my boss, well, I need $100 million to bring AI in to do the work. I took the budget that I had of open positions that I couldn't fill because I couldn't find people trained to do the work to supplement and basically pay for my AI. And I think that we need to start looking at our budgets and how we do things differently in order to satisfy the need and the gap that we have. In the front end, if you're not using automation in your front end, you're missing out. This is your big area to focus on automation. Why? Because if you get it right in the front end, guess what? The back is easy. The back is just transactional. So you should be using it for your digital front door. Um, I think all of us have known that because we've been doing it for the last 10 years, building that digital front door where we are taking care of the scheduling, taking care of, of the payments, taking care of the interactions with the patient, of the pre-registration, and so on. But we also need to remember that there's a possibility to also use it when that patient comes in the ER with your UR services and your CDI making it so those handoffs are seamless and data is presented to that doctor to make the decisions on observations and how we interact with the payer in a very streamlined uh, format. And I tell you that the payers are using AI basically to handle how they communicate with us in that front end and we need to be able to, they're using natural language processing and AI conversations to actually be their virtual agents. So why should we not be doing the same thing? 
And I also say, why should we not in our contracts say to the payer, hey, I'm tired of calling you. There is no reason we cannot use automation to interact together. Put an API in the front, have your natural uh, processing in the middle and API in the back that we're transacting information back and forth and we can eliminate a lot of these phone calls. They don't have the money for the staff. We don't have the money for the staff, but the technology is there to eliminate a great deal of the back and forth that we do. And I can tell you Blue Cross has done four different pilots of this nature around the country and many of them are moving on to be permanent. So do take the time to change the way that you're putting in your contracts and level them up so that they have to give you other options for communication and automation is the way to go. Then in your middle revenue cycle, oh my God, this is where CDI has the ability. We've been trying to use natural language processing and we go back and forth. Well, it's here now. It is a heightened level and you can truly use it with your CDI to have a situation that you're able to um, handle the queries in an automated fashion that there's guidance from the humans to actually elevate the query process. However, most of it could be automated. Giving your physicians that real-time query alert instead of everything having to be keeping them having to work late into the night trying to respond to queries, just as an example. And then, of course, the back end, so much automation in the back that we are doing. And I say to you, in this area, everything from our cash posting, our statusing, and our denial process. Redefining how we do our denials is essential for us to be able to handle the 35% increase in denials that have come our way since uh, COVID. Payers want to keep the money that they had uh, gained during the COVID period, and what have they done? They've increased our denials. Now, when we look at these, all these opportunities, where do you start? Starting your front end, you're gonna get your highest return. The most important thing is when you start, start with a program. I'm gonna talk a little bit more of how to put that program together, but the most important thing is do not believe that it's hiring a vendor and the vendor does it all. This is a partnership. This is about knowing your local needs and being able to partner together to solve problems. We could go to the next slide. And this is from Gartner. And I love this particular slide and you probably have seen it everywhere, but it is the three building blocks of moving from RPA to hyper automation. And it's understand that you are going to need three things. Basically, in order to be um, able to get hyper automation, you need to be agile. So you need to do the marriage between process automation, task, task automation, and augmentation. And the way that that works is understanding you take your data and then you want to elevate the data so the data is communicating to you not only what is going on and what are the norms, but also who does it best. So if I have 10 employees and Susie is able to get through more productivity and a higher resolution rate, and I have Jack who has a very high productivity but a low resolution rate, your system should be able to see what is Judy doing different that is causing that higher resolution rate and be able to teach Jack how to do what Judy is doing. But more importantly, now I want Judy to be monitoring the system and finding what else can we do better? What are the insights? So it's that agility of understanding and awareness, getting 
to the efficiency and then the efficacy that's going to happen because you are moving all through the system, understanding the degree of automations that are going to structure a running, continuously learning and expanding system. Um, Neo, this is super exciting, the, the concept of hyper automation. Uh, and I know there's some complexity in it uh, and a lot of learning for all of us to do. When, when you are selecting a vendor or a partner, you know, for a project, a hyper automation project, what are things that should be considered? What are you looking for in a, in a partner or a vendor? You know, we've gone in, um, in, in revenue cycle through a true cycle of change, you know, uh, back early, uh, late nineties, early two thousands, we were all about best in class, right? You wanted to get that vendor that did that particular thing the best. And then we went into, we want to make sure that we're streamlined and we basically use a vendor of choice that takes us all the way through all our processes. And we just don't want to be with a lot of vendors in our pool. We wanted to scope down how many vendors. However, with automation, you do want to go to the vendor of a class vendor. Why? Because you want to make sure that you understand that not all vendors can deliver everything. There's some vendors that are great in conversation AI or are great with machine learning and using machine learning to actually be able to streamline processes. And then there are vendors that are great for the front end and understanding what the vendor's talent is is step number one. Also, you want a vendor that's going to be very realistic with you about implementation times. If a vendor is coming to you and say, I could do that in eight weeks without even understanding what is happening in your house and all the different dynamics that you have, you have a vendor that's not being real with you. They're not being your partner. A partner is going to sit down with you and it's going to do a visioning session. And you're going to together not only figure out how you want to solve the problem, but what is it going to take to happen. So you want a vendor that is willing to actually give you a glimpse under the covers and say, I want to partner with you. And if they haven't done something before that you're trying to do something new, you should know their track records on what they have done and make sure that they have been a bit good partner to others. That's the starting point, is the partnership. As far as the automation is concerned, it really has to do with what are you trying to solve. Excellent, great insight. Thank you so much for that. Um, I, I have been through the world of vendor consolidation and uh, completely agree with, with your approach here on this particular subject. Um, I believe we are ready for our second poll question. So Jen, if you can cue that up for us. It's, do you believe that automation and AI can help improve the function of your department or your role um, going forward? So please select one. We'll take a look at the, at the audience responses here momentarily. Okay, Jen, what are we seeing? I thought that might be the case. <laughs> um, I think that uh, part of what we're seeing in this presentation um, makes us all think the answer is yes, and um, uh, and I completely agree. So this is uh, this is very encouraging. And with that, uh, Neo, I'll hand it over to you to continue the session. Absolutely. Next slide, please. So we talked about, okay, so, you know, to do automation, we have to be agile, we have to go for efficiencies, and then we, um, we end up with actually the value, right? The APCAR model, why did I select it for this particular presentation? It doesn't have to be this model, but what I love about it is that it's taking the human element and also understanding 
the, the actual solutioning of a problem. In order for us to be able to be successful in automating and doing hyper automation, we need to start embracing what we want to call a fusion team. Fusion teams are not IT people. They actually are business technologists, and those are people that understand the actual workflow. These are non-techies. These are people that are your best in your team, but I challenge you not to only put the best in your team in your fusion team. You actually need a learner that is a middle range learner. And this is a person that does middle range productivity that is you know, a, a very reliable, but they're not your superstar. They're right in the middle. And then you want some people that are practically new to your uh, group that are in the true learning phase. And you wanna put all these three different people together to understand and have awareness of what is it that you want to solve. And then the next thing is, how do you give them a what's in it for me? What is their personal choice and how they could be teaching this system to get it better? So I'll give you an example. If you have a bunch of, uh, of employees and you are just telling them what to do and you never listen about how they can make changes so that you can be more efficient and you don't give them kudos or give them a means of, of being part of the support process, you have just lost your awareness and you have lost the desire of them to be part of the solution. But if you bring them in and you have them be a part of that, then you get the knowledge to be able to teach that AI what it is that you're trying to solve for and train it to the point that they it understands what you know thus far and it continuously can learn from it. And then the ability becomes that group of people working with your IT staff making sure that the skills and behavior of the system continue to grow to achieve the performance that, and behavior that you want to achieve. What ends up happening is you're going to have a group of people that are in continuous learning mode. And then it's just about reinforcing that environment and creating an ecosystem that learning becomes the norm. And what I'm talking about is you cannot have a situation that you trained an employee when they first joined your organization and you think that 10 years later, that's enough training. That employee has to learn just as you change different modules and different systems, there has to be continuous learning. And when you put a system in, it's just you put in the bare bones. Now you have to continuously be optimizing and you have to do the same thing with your AI product. You set up and you put in a work process. The fact of the matter is if you truly want to gain the return on investment is you learn from the way that you put it in and you are continuously optimizing. But the only way to do it is to have a team of people that want to feed that intelligence and be the critical thinkers to support the AI system. So 41% of your staff should be in this fusion team perspective. And it, what it means is that you have 41% of your people basically monitoring, giving their value, their talent, and giving you information. But you're continuously moving the spectrum so it's not the same 41% all the time. It, everybody gets a chance to be part of the narrative. Now you have a workforce that has purpose. And at the same time, you have artificial intelligence that's meeting your goals because you're continuously updating it. Please do not believe that you can just put in 
automation and AI and leave it stagnant. You will not get your return on investment. This is a journey and a partnership with your vendor, your team, your talent team, and of course, understanding that this is the way that you're going to be doing business from now on. And the results will be there, but it has to be a true continuously learning environment and continuously changing environment. And it could be a lot of fun or it could be a drain. And it's a drain when you don't understand that you have to continuously change. You have to embrace the change. Next slide. So how do you do it? There are 10 ways to increase the likelihood that you're gonna have success in your hyper automation. Number one is take the work that the business technologists that we were talking about, that Fusion team, very seriously. If you do, you'll have a 90% chance of true return and basically potential for success. Ensure that there's responsiveness when the team identifies something. You can't ignore it because then you are hurting the culture. If you are not understanding that they've identified something and coming up with a plan of resolution or working together to create that plan, then you are gonna basically break your ecosystem. And make sure that you accelerate the access to technical experts. Make sure that you have the right people available so information is continuously being able to be updated and that people can fix things, fix breaks, fix breaks. And remember, we talked about having that ability not to do a waterfall, but more of an agile approach. And that's why the technical experts are so important. Recognize and value and reward your business technologist. Celebrate the small successes and let them continuously go into learning for certifications um, and whatever would be a reward that is great for your culture. Remember that there are over 12,000 certification programs that can be done online for less than from $200 actually, all the way to $2,000. And they all supplement some form of AI. And you have the ability to provide that to your staff. And there are also 3,000 free courses that you can get online. So what I'm trying to say is you can provide this learning because it's available out there at a price that is prohibitive of your success. And then broker the connections with other, uh, with other practices and communities. Make sure that uh, you have teams that are going to rise. You know, it's a new organization, but it gives us the ability to understand what's going on in AI and that we can now deploy information amongst ourselves. And of course, the co-owning of technology, that partnership we talked about with our vendors, promoting participation for hyper automation across opportunities. So working with the clinical teams and bridging those gaps and then co-create with your vendors because not everything is gonna be perfectly built already. So make sure that you are that beta or that alpha and create newness that can really transform our ecosystem and revenue cycle. If we follow these basic 10 steps, now we are creating a total difference in how we do business. Excellent, thank you, Nia. We're getting a lot of comments about um, how valuable this information is. So thank you again for sharing us. A quick question for you, you know, you mentioned a fair amount about change management. You mentioned, you know, the fusion team and business technologists. And when you're putting all this together, can you expand a little bit on how it all comes together as a role in this AI transformation? One thing I'm thinking is, you know, a, a lot of 
people likely are may not be experts in change management. So when you're going through a project like this, do you pull some of those experts into like, um, do you incorporate HR or training or others to help in something? It seems like a big job. And I just wondered if you could kind of expand on all that. Absolutely. Well, you know, this is something that is a major change to the way that we do business. We have been in a business of we buy technology, we implement it, and we keep going. This is not like that. This is beyond hiring your project manager. This is new thinking. So it is a situation that to start your strategy, you must first learn how to lead in this new environment. So that's the first step in change management is understanding how you're going to have this new culture, which is a culture of open conversation and also continuous learning. And in with that, you start doing things like stay interviews with your teammates, making sure that you understand what would make them stay with your environment and also what they see as their basic talent, because that's the way that you can immediately start creating that ecosystem, that change of the business technologist. If you don't know what their passion is, you can't put them in the right seat and you can't, and, and they will not volunteer for that right seat. And you actually do need that type of situation. So what's the hardest piece of all this is the change and understanding that you first have to change the way that you have delivered being a leader and now be that empathetic, humble leader that is leading with curiosity and wanting their team to bring their talents to life. Once you have that set up, the rest is pretty easy because you know what you need to solve for. Now it's partnering and creating the work and embracing that mistakes are wonderful. Mistakes are the opportunity to actually evolve. Super helpful. Um, in the interest of time, we're gonna skip the last poll question, which I think we can probably guess the answer to after this um, wealth of knowledge that we've just been um, through. Uh, we do have quite a few questions that have come in, so I want to take the last few minutes here to allow uh, Neo to, uh, to help us with some of these questions. Um, one question that came in um, early was um, this. It says, when you say automation, do you include integration and interoperability? If not, what role does that play? And if you could expand on that a little. Yeah, I, I definitely do include it. And the reason that I include it is you cannot have true automation of workflow processes without integration and in, in interoperability. Remember, we're not talking about just task-oriented automation. We're talking about hyper-automation, which basically is invoking multiple models of artificial intelligence, the machine learning, the conversational AI. The narrow AI is when you are basically just doing tasks. That's what we've been used to. We're talking about general AI, which now basically says all hands on deck. We're going to use automation in all the different verticals, and we're going to incorporate them together to have true synergy. Excellent, thank you so much. We've had another, um, we've had quite a few, but one just uh, came in from Kirk and Kirk asks, what is the, I'm sorry, with the cost of AI, what healthcare KPIs should a health system monitor so the executive <clears throat> leadership team can see the bottom line ROI? A good question. It's a great question. Um, the the thing about it it goes back to when you start your strategy uh, and depending on what you're automating you always need to create some kpis along that um, align so that you can monitor the win now a lot of the kpis that 
if you're just talking RPA, you're going to basically look at productivity, right? Uh, the difference in product, I, I have the productivity of 10 people uh, versus one person because of the automation and the speed of automation with RPA. Now, when you start looking at artificial intelligence from the machine learning conversational, it becomes a little different because now you have to create KPIs based on sometimes denials. Did my denial rate go down? Or am I measuring the resolution rate of my denials because I'm using automation for that? So basically, you will have to create individual KPIs associated to what you're automating or what you're using artificial intelligence for. And it is, that is why you want to have those visioning sessions that you sit down and you agree on what is the right KPI associated with that automation. And it will change depending on the type of automation that you're putting in. Not evaluating your question, but it is very specific depending on the automation type. Excellent, thank you. We have another one from Paul and it says, it seems like we're just cracking the surface on automation. How far do you feel we have to go? Uh, you know, what's the, what's, the, what's the future basically? Yeah, absolutely. I think we are literally just scratching the surface uh, with automation. What does it look like on the other side? It looks like a total different relation between us and our payers. It, it looks like enough of the, you know, gaming that we have been living with the payers. The fact of the matter is the payers will already know that we have the same intelligence that they have and we no longer are in a situation that we're waiting for them to give us information and dashboards. We can create them ourselves based on the information, the traction, and the data that we have. The fact of the matter is the more data we have, the more rich we can make our automation and our machine learning because the machines will learn more. We are not going to eliminate humans. That is not even a part of the equation. What we're going to have is a more sophisticated workforce. Our workforce will be guiding technology as to what we want it to do and what we need from it. And that is what our teams will be doing. They will be critical thinkers in the guiding process and they will be handling the complex things that a human can pivot to that the computer won't be able to pivot to even in 2030. So there's always going to be a human element, but all these redundant tasks that we currently are doing will be eliminated. Now, depending on the dollars that an organization has, the faster we'll move towards that. Look how long it took us to get everybody on EHRs. So this is not a sprint. This is a major journey. Got it. Excellent. This has been, we're, we're at time here. Neo, I can't thank you enough. Uh, your insight and vision uh, it has been incredibly helpful for, uh, for me and for the audience today. I want to draw everyone's attention um, down to the contact information that you see um, on the screen there. Um, if you would like to reach out to Neo, um, there's her information. If you would like more information from Vine Medical, we obviously specialize in revenue cycle automation and we'd love a chance to talk to you as well. Uh, so again, thanks for everyone. We will um, have recordings of this presentation that go out to the attendees as well. Um, and so until next time, thanks everybody. I appreciate it. Have a great day. Thank you.